Hello and welcome to the CX Files for May 4th, 2023. It's Star Wars Day and I am Mark Hillary in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I'm Peter Ryan in Montreal. Mark, I didn't know it was Star Wars Day. Shed some light on this. I, I'm not familiar with that uh, National Day of Celebration, although I think I should be. Of course. May the 4th be with you. Okay, well, I think my dad would call that a shaggy dog story, uh, but I, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, we've got a really interesting guest this week um, and a really interesting topic because we're actually looking at the future of BPO. And as you know, listening to this podcast, many of our guests have come from uh, across the BPO community. Um, but Ian Barking, uh, the last time I ran into him, he was the chief of strategy at Sykes. And he was there because he founded a company focused on automation called Symphony Ventures and Sykes bought out his company. Um, and so a lot of that automation expertise went into Sykes. Um, but if you look at Ian's CV now, I mean, yeah, it's like thought leader would be a sort of quick way to describe it. But, you know, he's on the advisory council with Bain and company. Uh, he's written courses about automation and RPA that, that hundreds of thousands of people have used on LinkedIn. Um, so, you know, he's kind of a thought leader and I can see that he's got something going on on LinkedIn that's still in stealth mode. So clearly he's got something that he's cooking up as well for the future. Um, and we, we really sort of kicked off by asking um, just some basic questions around, you know, what's going on with BPOs right now. Um, in particular, all of the consolidation that's taking place at the moment, it seems like the biggest players in the industry are all buying each other. Um, I mean, what's your take on that, Peter? Do you think that do you think that bigger is better? I don't think necessarily bigger is better. I'm not going to say that that you can't find good economies of scale. I don't think that we can outright say that you're not going to be able to drive innovation. But the reality is, Mark, as, as you and I were chatting before we hit the record button, there are concerns that many of us have out there. When you get mega consolidation, you're effectively seeing uh, purchases for more workstations. You're seeing purchases for contracts. I'm not one of the people who thinks that that mega consolidation is going to bring the innovation. I'm not somebody who thinks that it's going to necessarily be on the side of the enterprise client or at the end of the day of the, the consumer. Um, we understand businesses are in this to make money, but if you take a look at the locations around the world, no matter what the industry, where you see the best innovation, where you see the, the best outcomes, where you see the, the, the most creativity, it's usually ones where they've been able to avoid mega consolidation in, in a space. And I'm not saying, again, I want to be very clear, I'm not against m &A activity. I'm not against consolidation in a sector. It's natural. It shows that a sector is growing, that there's opportunity. But we also have to be very careful about the extent to which organizations will focus on that top line revenue number or the top line agent number and forget about what can be done to drive more innovation in the space. Yeah, th that top line agent number is something that I think um, historically we've always seen a sign of success and growth if your headcount is growing. Um, and yet that doesn't really sort of seem applicable these days with so much automation being applied, uh, so many tools available. Uh, you know, ChatGPT is only a few months old, and yet we're already seeing how it could potentially revolutionize the way we do self-service. Uh, you know, why would you need an FAQ when you have an AI engine that can actually create answers for you? So, uh, you know, I talked to Ian a lot about some of these things, but, uh, you know, clearly there's a number of different tracks going on within the BPO industry at present. And some of that is the technology evolving, but then all of this kind of M&A activity as well. So, so you know, clearly there's, there's, uh, there's some very different areas taking place. Well, it's going to be a great interview. Let's go straight to it to find out a little bit of what Ian's thoughts are on the future of our industry in BPO. Okay. Right, Ian, it's great to get you uh, on the podcast. Um, I think you, you appeared, didn't you, a couple of years ago? Uh, I, I think it was during the pandemic. Years and years ago, and so yeah. nice to be back. Thanks so much for yeah. having me, Mark. Excellent, excellent. I saw you recently contributing to a collaborative article on LinkedIn, which I think 
it's a, it's a new feature that they're doing where essentially they create a title and then they ask experts to sort of contribute the actual content. Uh, and this was all about BPO. Um, and I thought that some of your answers were interesting. You know, they were popping up in my news feed. So I was seeing you probably sitting at home answering all these questions and, yes. and I was seeing them on my feed. So I thought that, you know, we, we met when you were at Sykes uh, and we did some work together there. Um, and so, you know, you clearly you've got a lot of BPO experience as well as a lot of knowledge around AI innovation and all these kind of different areas that are changing BPO. Um, so I thought that we could just sort of run through some, some ideas around the, the, the topics that you were talking about. Um, so, I mean, you know, let's kick off. I mean, BPO itself, I know that the, the number itself varies, but, but in general, we still see about three quarters of all customer service managed in-house. So, so why haven't the, the BPOs tapped into this? I mean, why can't they sort of get that, that there must be a huge volume of customer service activity that, that BPOs are not handling? There, there is. Uh, this sends me back about 10 years ago when I did a, a business plan then I think the, the ratio was more like 10% was outsourced and 90% was captive at the time. So there's progress that's been made to if, if it is a 25-75 split now. Um, but you're absolutely right. Most enterprises uh, still choose to retain this capability. Uh, when I was in BPO, our, our sales pitch was your, your back office is our front office. Uh, in so much as it's a cost center for you, but it is our business. So uh, give us the work because it's what we wake up every day focused on uh, refining and becoming specialists in and running well for you. But there are a lot of reasons why enterprises choose not to work with BPOs too. Um, and some of them are structural, some of them in finance and health in healthcare, others where they they need to keep work um, close to the enterprise, or at least domestic within the operations of the enterprise. Um, and there are other areas where they just feel like uh, the intimacy to those processes is actually beneficial to operating the, the overall company. And then sometimes it's just, it's just fiefdom, right? It's just, uh, I don't want to give up heads or power or budget. Uh, I want to control it internally. Uh, so anyone in all of those elements contribute to why enterprises um, haven't tapped into BPO. Uh, and and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the last, which is also, I think, just um, just a, a lack of awareness. They may not know about the the opportunities, the potential, the benefits that come from working with a, a specialist third party provider. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I suppose one of the things that I saw you talking about was how different BPOs are compared. You know, so when a client is considering um, outsourcing, working with a BPO, um, often they talk about all the things, all the shiny, nice things they want. So they talk about transformation and innovation, but then in the end of the day, they, they just compare the price. So, I mean, is it, is, is it still just the cost of the contract that matters most? Uh, unfortunately, yes, in a majority of cases, at least my experience still suggests that. Uh, and as you, as you say, when, when you initially start to scope the the potential of a deal you sit down and you look at whatever the scope of the work is whether it's back or front office whether it's like finance and accounting or hr transactional processes or customer care or it support desk or whatever name it when you sit down you start to put your creative hat on and so these enterprises do start to think it would be really nice if dot 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 uh, and in some cases that's them going through their wish list that's collected over over years and years of man it would be really cool if we could do the following we just don't have the bandwidth or don't have the budget and we're too busy keeping the ship afloat uh, and then elsewhere too that that wish list is is grown further by a lot of the sales pitches and the narrative that comes from the the potential bpo partners who filled them with um you know, fantasies of application of all sorts of modern technologies and continuous, uh, continuous improvement processes, et cetera. Uh, but to your point, at the end of the day, this is a service that's purchased. And this, uh, unfortunately, I need to restrain myself. Stop me <laughs> very soon, Mark. Um, but when it's a service that's purchased, it goes through procurement. Procurement 
compares things it needs to to normalize them and uh, specialty um, interests uh, distinction uniqueness is often squeezed out throughout that process and what you uh, what you end up honing in on and focusing on and basing entire deals on is just are you more or less expensive than those other ones um, which I think is the worst thing that could happen and has created a real um, sort of dearth of true innovation and change in our industry for decades. And I was thinking, yeah, does that does that sort of transfer into like the first time outsourcing, especially, you know, so mm-hmm. where you've got processes in-house, uh, the management of say the customer service director right. essentially thinks that they're just going to get the partner to replicate what they're already doing right. um, rather than having the knowledge that if you're working with a specialist you could actually be going on a transformation journey rather than just outsourcing you know your your customer service team absolutely and, and it's, a, it's a combination of things it's sort of the henry ford if i asked them what they'd want faster horses would be the answer right so it's it is I, this is this is the the world I see today, the service I'm used to today that gets the job done that I need getting done. Uh, I'd just like you to make it a little bit better, so faster horses, so you you don't think disruptive and transformational necessarily, which is which is understandable because most of these operators have really hard jobs. They're they're keeping customer services or IT support any of those functions up and running, and that's no easy feat. Um, so that's a challenge. And then there's also just risk mitigation and, and again, an education element of it's scary to hand over a function to someone else. And so, um, so the most sensible thing is to take a baby step and hand over exactly what you do to then be able to compare it and say, do you recruit and hire and onboard and train and retain and track and manage the same way that we're used to so we can just compare that and make sure that it's up to snuff with what we need it to be. Um, and then after you develop a degree of comfort with a third party um, uh, partner, then you can start to, you know, you can start to get a little bit more creative and, and move from classical to jazz sort of thing and start to think more creative, uh, creatively together. Uh, ideally, that would be the way that things go if, if contracts allowed for creativity. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to ask you next, because I saw you saying on one of your, your collaborative answers that, that we should start thinking of BPO deals more like marriages, um, where you know, you've know you got an initial contract, you set out your initial expectations, but you, you should know from the outset, there's going to be ups and downs and some things are not going to work and you have to keep working at the relationship. So, I mean, do we, do we just not see these deals as partnerships then? Uh, in my experience, no. They are a a master servant dynamic, um, both from a governance and a contract setup, from an ongoing maintenance setup, and just from a mentality and approach setup. Right, I'm giving you my business, and I'm going to pay you. You're going to do what I need you and want you to do. Um, in the process, I'm going to start to get a little a little cheeky about the the SLAs I choose to require you to follow. I mean, I had a contract once where they wanted us to operate at ninety five percent. Um, compliance to an SLA. And when we did our due diligence, they internally were operating at a 35% achievement level. And so you just think, well, just you think that I'm going to be able to create magic. I mean, we'll, we'll help to improve, but jump from 35 to 95 just by transferring the work. That's, that's wishful thinking and frankly unfair of, of our relationship. And it was all predicated on that dynamic of, of you serve me and I get to dictate um, what you do. And, and you know, contract um, sort of credits and, and fees are punitive and there is no room for uncertainty and ultimately, again, uh, flexibility and creativity. And so if there is no room, then the operator, the, the service provider, sticks to the letter of the law. Um, does what they need to 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 survive and and stay compliant, and that's a pretty um, it's a it's a it's a pretty hard environment in which to to innovate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I saw another comment that you made that was around 
I mean, BPOs themselves, it, it was sort of describing what are they? And I think you said something like a loose collective of contracts between the BPO and the clients, and they might have hundreds of these contracts, yes. and each one is slightly different. Um, you know, the industry itself is ruled by these, these contracts. Um, right. Often they're directed by the client describing what they need from the service company. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you've got, you know, clients dictating what's in the contract, every client wanting something different and then locking those in over a number of years, then how do you get any sort of widespread change in the organization that kind of cuts across all clients? Yes. No, you're absolutely, I mean, it's, it's maybe I was watching a nature show recently, but it makes me think of coral where coral isn't a single living organism. It's just lots and lots of little organisms that have all sort of glued together. And, and as a result, they become this, this massive structure. And BPO is that, right? We've, we've, we're, we're company A contract, company B, company C, and even sub-segmented into that, we're company A out of India, we're company A's contract out of Guatemala, we're company A's out of Philippines, and they almost act autonomously. And so, um, which, you know, is, is, is perhaps one of the strengths that you stand up a really good, um, you know, team lead, you put together a really good recruitment process, you find good talent, you create a culture that tries to emulate and honor that of the client. So if you're used to site tours of BPOs, you'll walk one floor and it's bright red for that client. And the next one's bright blue for the next client. The next one's covered in video game paraphernalia for that third client. Um, and that's the right thing to do for the BPOs to better serve their clients. Uh, but as you say, Mark, to, to then be able to steer that large coral structure uh, becomes very difficult uh, and does take some, some, um, some very nuanced management by, by leadership that uses a strong organizational culture around certain commitments, whether that commitment is development to its people or creating really great experiences for its customers, whatever that is, that's the glue that helps you start to pivot a bit. Um, but end of the day, it's still very hard to, to, to fully pivot without partnerships and collaboration with your clients. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I guess that's one of the problems is that quite often the client sort of indicates the headcount that they're prepared to pay for. Um, yes. they, they know that their volume of customer service interactions requires 300 FTEs, for example, and, and they sort of indicate on the contract that's their expectation. And, and that's also how they expect to pay for the service. So, you know, I, and I said before we started recording, I was saying to you that I wrote about gain sharing 20, 20 years ago and how if you're genuinely creating a partnership together, you should find how can you measure a way that both of us can succeed. But, but we're still talking about FTEs today. Right. Wouldn't it be spectacular? I mean, and you know, and you were right. You had that vision um, however long ago. And, and there have been other attempts at creating sort of a vested, shared, collaborative, um, you know, skin in the game kind of uh, set of commercial models it's easier to just know I've got 50 people and I'm going to charge you X per person, X times 50. That's, that's easy math to do. Um, it, it takes creativity, acceptance, and, and a real sort of leap of faith, I suppose, from both sides to say this contract isn't about FTEs. It's about you know, pick it. It's about delight, right? The only measure we're going after now is an NPS score increased by X percent. And we're going to do everything possible to, to do that. And then compensation comes as a result of you know, staged increases in NPS. You got to do the math to figure out so that you're not getting overbilled for that. But I would argue that the, the byproduct the result of really, really happy customers is is well in you know is, is many fold whatever the the cost to get there is the benefit justifies that that model was a worthwhile experiment and and hopefully then permeates the industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the change in the industry, especially in the past year or two, has been around automation, 
um, AI, especially, you know, tools like ChatGPT and Google's Bard, kind mm -hmm. of really reshaping how people realize they can have actual sort of conversations with AI systems now. Um, yes. So isn't there scope here for a major technology player just to come in and take business from the BPOs. I mean, in the same way that we see Apple going in and transforming payments and loans and all kinds of financial services. I mean, why didn't MasterCard and Visa do that instead? It's, this, is the, this is the second person in, in a day who's used that analogy. And I, and I absolutely agree that ultimately, if you look at the, if you focus on the fundamentals, right? It wasn't BPO, BPO shouldn't be about HR. And effectively, that's what it was. And by that, I mean, um, a lot of the BPO suppliers didn't have authority over designing a, a script or a recruitment process or innovating the the end to end achievement of an outcome. Their job was to hire people, put their butts in seats and hire new people to put butts in the same seats that had just been vacated by high attrition. And that was that was unfortunately a lot of the industry. Um, if you and that's that wasn't the you know, core principle, the core principle was, was really good experience, really great outcome, happy customers, or at least customers that, that had their, their issues resolved. Um, so yeah, so you don't have to be a BPO to come in and disrupt this. And you're absolutely right. The capabilities that are getting better and better at emulating the mechanics of, you know, call openings, uh, issue identification, issue resolution, all of the all of the elements that did make up our industry. It's going to be a really interesting 18 months. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking off the top of my head, you've got a company like AWS that's got massive cloud capabilities. Why don't they just create a cloud contact center service that, you know, pay as you go and Gig, gig based agents you know and it's like well suddenly you've got your solution there but it's a tech company yes with mark hillary at the helm of it i think <laughs> maybe I, maybe I can't wait to hear the story no but you're right i mean it, it's it it is the laws of physics in all industries so to, to open an aperture for a moment uh, every industry right now is should be scrambling every large enterprise at very least should be scrambling to to have a uh, a corporate point of view and then ultimately an attempt at a strategic roadmap around large language models the application of conversational ai that you know right now is most commonly thought of as chat gpt and uh and what does that mean to every function within the business and and who you are and, and what you do which which is interesting, Mark, because you know, go back decades in our industry, the 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 stories that you and I were were so lucky lucky to play a part in, outsourcing was that call to reflection from an enterprise. Who are we? What really differentiates us? What do we need to keep internally? And what can we we hand to an expert? And and there was a scope of work that they didn't need to retain anymore. And now same, same story, but just much, much more powerful tool set to, to ask themselves that same exact question and reflect on who is any, any enterprise these days and, and what can they achieve via, via partnerships and technology platforms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've moved on a long way from core competence and, and all that kind of stuff. Indeed. Okay. Um, I, I mean, just to round off then, um, because I know you've got loads of interesting things going on, but, but maybe you could just sort of say, you, you know, in, in addition to what we've already talked about, chat GPT, etc. I mean, yeah. what, what do you think is really exciting? What, what's coming up in the sort of near future that, that you're really interested in, in, in the sort of BPO space? Um, it's interesting. So in the, in the CX BPO space, we're seeing a lot of consolidation. There are a lot of big, big companies now as a result of acquisitions, some of which you know, I, was, I, I was parts of those stories in, in some way, shape, or form in their past. Um, I think that sets us up for a lot of potential disruption just because the bigger the enterprise gets, and you know, sorry to all my friends who are at those organizations, the bigger you get, the worse your, your ability to pivot becomes the harder it becomes to to truly pivot. And so I think those will be more the traditional 
butts and seat players, even though they have invested heavily and some of them have some really smart people at the helm of digital initiatives, um, some of whom are, are close friends of mine, so I wish them well, but, uh, but I think there's room for disruption. I think there's a ton of room for disruption from, as you say, it could be could be a tech player. It could literally just be a, you know, a start from scratch, bottom up chat GPT first sort of player. Uh, and so that's what I'm excited about and, and something I've spent my time sort of looking into and, and helping advise and, and hopefully define and, and launch. Um, so that'll be interesting. Um, and then who knows where all this technology is going to take us. It's frankly, I guess, Mark, the most, the most um, sort of sobering discussions I've ever had have happened over the last few weeks with some of the smartest people I know about uh, the the focused and then the broader implications of these technical capabilities in our world of work. Uh, some of it's fantastic and magical and exciting to see finally that some of these these tools are are good enough to be worth our attention. Right, IVRs, OCRs, we've had them for decades, but let's be honest, IVRs suck. People calling in and having to deal with that sort of technology was always painful. Um, it just got a heck of a lot better. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, but I also think that there's a divide. I mean, I just, I, I was just on stage two days ago at a, at, a, at a call center event, you know, where all the cool kids hang out. And, uh, and I asked a, a room full of people, there, eh, it, was a, it was a breakout group, so there were about 50 people in the room, and I asked how many of them had heard of RPA, right, robotic process automation, something that I spent the last decade of my life playing with, it served me well, I'm very passionate about it, um, I do a lot of teaching on it, um, five people in a room of 50 raised their hand that they'd heard of it, which, which you know, usually I'm Usually, I, you know, not a whole lot pops up when I'm on stage that surprises me. I was just shocked. I was literally just floored and with, <laughs> I was, didn't, have, didn't have words. But the 10% of the room had heard about something that I'd been playing with for 10 years means that all of this exciting tech that you and I are discussing right now will either start to be looked at by them in 10 years or they won't be there in 10 years because they'll just fully be gone. Um, because they haven't committed to uh, maintaining uh, an up-to-date digital literacy that makes them able to look at and apply the technologies that are coming at us like a freight train. I mean, there is, yeah. there's just, there's really two options, get on board or get off the track. And, uh, and it's in this, the speed, I guess the other the last point is, is the speed of this iteration is just dizzying. Um, whereas before the technologies that we've talked about, whether it's, whether it's the ability to transport data over ethernet and Citrix to teams far away, or the application of RPA software to emulate routine tasks, or the adoption of chatbots and IVR into call trees, um, that all felt fast, but is going to look like glacial pace compared to what's hitting us in the next two years yeah yeah well that seems like a great place to stop anyway so you've, you've got to get on the train or get left behind that's right yeah <laughs> yeah okay Very excellent good. thanks a lot for that perfect oh, thanks a million mark it's great to talk to you again Thanks for listening to the CX Files podcast. We really appreciate your feedback and suggestions. You can reach myself, Mark Hillary, or Peter Ryan via LinkedIn. Please also leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast provider, as that helps more people to find us. As always, we'd like to thank Chris Haig at Traction Media for the CX Files graphics. See you next week.